Okay. We are recording and we're ready to go. Uh, how's the sound, everybody? Okay. Good. <laughs> Paul, you're letting your um, mathematical prowess <laughs> goog instead of good. <laughs> Google is a mathematical thing, right? <laughs> okay. Besides being a search engine, but <laughs> all right. Okay, folks, let's um, let us um, just recap basically what it is that we're talking about here. We're doing uh, the tenth tikkun tonight. I know that we skipped a couple. The one or two that we skipped in between um, is because they're really variations on other ones that we've already learned, and um, there's not so much to glean out of them. Although obviously there's something to glean, but uh, I thought I would go on to the one, the num number 10 that we're going to do tonight. What we are doing, for those of you, this is the first time that you're here, um, we are at, currently studying the Tikkunei Zohar. The Tikkunei Zohar is one of the works of the Zohar, one of the sections of the Zohar, essentially. It's a different, uh, it's a separate work from the Zohar itself. But um, it is called the Tikkunei Zohar, which basically means rectifications of the Zohar. Not that the Zohar itself needs rectifications, but these are rectifications that are done by and through the Zohar. When I say rectifications, what we essentially mean by rectifications, the word in Hebrew is, is Tikkun. Tikkun means to rectify or to improve or to restore. Um, the original Tikkun came about because uh, of the shattering of the worlds of Tohu. And if you need um, uh, an explanation of that, um, I believe I do have that on my website on kabbaladecoder.com. If not, shoot me an email and I'll send you an article on it that I wrote. Or you can go to kabbalahonline.org uh, and look for my name and then look for the shattering of the vessels. Um, and you'll see an article that I wrote there. In any event, um, the rectification and the restoration of the vessels that were shattered is called tikkun. So the Zohar discusses 70 different tikkunim, 70 different forms of rectification, and they're all based on the word bereshit. They're all based on the first word of the Torah, bereshit in the beginning. But there's 70 different permutations of this word bereshit. We've been through a few of them already. We're now on the 10th one. And the 10th one, which again, this is the word bereshit. If we um, select out certain letters, as you can see, I have put some in blue and some in red. If we take those blue letters and we form that, we form a word, we form the word shir, a song. And then the other letters, the taf and the aleph and the bet, forms the word ta'ev, which can be translated as the song of desire or alternatively the desired song. When you say a song of desire, that's usually uh, what you get in kind of Hollywood music, a uh, song of desire, and that's not the intention over here. It's the song of the desire of the soul to elevate itself to a higher level. The whole concept of song is related to elevation, to be elevated to a higher level. Who was it that sang in the temple? the primary people that were working, doing the work in the temple, was the priest, the priestly class called the Kohanim. The Kohanim, the priests. But the people who were doing the songs which accompanied the sacrifices and so on and so forth, the people who were actually singing and making music were the Levim, the Levites. The Levites, as opposed to the Kohanim, the Kohanim were people of tremendous outpouring of kindness and love. The Levim, the Levites, on the other hand, their focus was not on the aspect of chesed, which was the Kohen, but rather, to, as it says in the verse, to mecha v'urecha le'ish chasidecha. 
the Urim and Tumim. The Urim and Tumim was a device that was used to um, to arouse divine inspiration or even prophecy. It was called the Urim Vatumim. It was a physical device that was used, which had the name of God buried in it, and I'm not going to go into it now. But the um, the Kohen, the, the the high priest, the Kohen Godel, wore the Urim Vatumim. And it says, to the man of chesed, yet to the man of kindness, to the man of love, which was Aaron. Whereas the man of song, or the men of song, the people of song, were the Levites. They would do the singing. They were from the aspect of Gevura, as opposed to chesed. Chesed is on the right column, and Gevura is on the left column. Um, I should have actually prepared this beforehand, but I didn't think I would talk about this few rots. So one second, let me just get a chart. Uh, here we go. It's just loading up one second. Yeah, here we go. And why would it go over? I don't know. Okay, here we go. Let's make it a bit bigger. Okay. As everybody knows, Chesed is on the right column of the Svirot and Gvura is on the left column of the Svirot. The Svirot are divided into, the Svirot of the world of Tikkun are divided into columns. There's a right column, there's the left column, and there's the middle column. In the world of Tohu, they were all in one column, and that's why they broke. It's one of the reasons that's explained as to why they broke. In any event, the Kohanim, the men of kindness, are from the side of Chesed, whereas the Levites are from the side of Gvura. Now, when we say Gvura, Gvura is not necessarily a negative thing. It can be. Gvura, Gvura can be harshness, but it can also be withdrawnness, to withdraw into oneself, to withdraw upwards. As there's a verse, a verse in the Song of Songs, which is also related to this, I'll talk about it in a minute. The verse in the Song of Songs, which says, his right arm, embra- his left hand is under my head. It's talking about two lovers. But it's really only an analogy. The analogy is for the soul and God. So it says that his left hand, God's left hand embrace, uh, sorry, God's left hand is under my head, raising up the head, and his right arm embraces me. So that's the function of Chesed and Gvura. Chesed is to embrace, and Gvura is to lift up, to raise up, to elevate. And that's exactly what the concept of song is all about. The concept of song is to elevate. Now, obviously, when we talk about song that elevates, we're probably not talking about uh, the songs that that we... um, here on the local, uh, you know, pop um, channels and so on. Those don't elevate. It seems to me that most of them actually do the opposite. They just bring a person down. A very important thing to know, in fact, that um, that song has the ability to elevate and it also has the ability to cause a person to be brought down very often. Um, Depression itself can be cured by music. If you remember the story of Saul, Saul was kind of in a state of depression, in a black mood for whatever reason, let's not go into it now, but he's in this black, dark mood. And David was the one who played the harp in order to raise up his, uh, to, to lift up the, um, the, 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 the cloud of the dark cloud that was hanging over his head and lift him up to, uh, to, to, uh, to a state of, uh, to, into a state of joy. And that's what good music, proper music can do. And of course, improper music can do exactly the opposite, which is why I think that uh, there's so much violence associated with music. Um, Some music today, especially rap music and things like that, is incredibly, the words are just incredibly violent, but so is the tune. And we should not be allowing our children, if we can avoid it in any way, we should not be allowing our children or... uh, this music shouldn't be played in our houses. It's very destructive, very uh, destructive of the soul. 
someone has to think about it. Of course, I'm not telling you what to do, but um, just something to keep in mind. Okay. So that is the concept of song. The concept of song is again to elevate. Now, what is the word ta'ev means? That's the word song, but ta'ev means to desire. It's the song which causes us to desire a higher level of being or causes us to desire to want to cleave to the Almighty, to cleave to God, to cleave to the root of the soul, to cleave to God, however you want to explain it. Now, this is the meaning of the word Bereshit in this particular uh, explanation of, um, of the Zohar. So, Um, this, in fact, is what the Zohar uh, says. This is what the Zohar says. Um, where are we here? Here, okay. The Zohar says as follows. It takes this word. Um, this is a tense tikkun, as it says, Bereshit Shir Ta'ev. And then it reads um, in Aramaic and, uh, and then afterwards in Hebrew. It says like this. This is the song which is the most praiseworthy of all songs. The song that the Zohar is talking about, the Tikkun Zohar is talking about here, is the most praiseworthy of songs. The most desirable of all songs. Regarding which it states, this is the song of songs that King Solomon wrote. The song of songs, Asher Lishlomo. Now, that's translated in two different ways. The Song of Songs that was written by Solomon is the simple, straightforward meaning because the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, that particular book of the Bible, of biblical literature, was written by King Solomon. But the sages explain that the word Lishlomo actually means to the king to whom there is peace. The word Shlomo is actually based on the word Shalom, which means peace. But the song of songs to the, to, to the one to whom peace belongs. The song of songs to he whom, to whom peace belongs. I actually, many, many years ago, um, I started writing a, um, I started writing a commentary on the song of songs based on the Zohar's commentary. Actually, let me see if I can find it. Let me be interesting for you if you just see this one second. Uh, song. No, I have that in Hebrew. One second. Here. No. Uh, one second. Uh, All right, let me see if I can find it. All right, it's not uh, it's not opening up over here. I have to find it. I, I have it on my computer somewhere. I have to uh, I have to open it up. And it's probably on the Zohar, actually. It's probably on the Zohar, and that's where it's on. The <laughs> Sorry, I get these. Uh... So is anyone interested in seeing it? Um, so, I don't know. Whatever. All right, never mind. Uh, let's, let's not get into it now. It's going to take me too long to find it. In any event, uh, I started doing it, but um, um, I sort of left off in the middle. Where actually, and right at the end of the first chapter, I couldn't find the right translation for, uh, for one sentence and um, one that rhymed, because I wrote it in rhyme, actually. Um, uh, I wrote the whole thing in rhyme. It's, very, it's, it's actually pretty well, <laughs> pretty well done, if I say so myself. But anyway. Um, so, <laughs> am I getting, uh, rather, uh, um, big headed here? Uh, probably. Um, all right. I'll have to look for it. Um, I gotta find it somewhere. I don't know where, but, uh, I don't know where it is, but I'll, I will find it somewhere. 
I'll let you know about it. In any event, the Song of Songs to he whom, to whom peace belongs, in other words, to God. It's the Song of Songs of God. It's the song, to put it another way, the song that all other songs sing. It's the song that all other songs sing. That's the Song of Songs, the Song of the Songs themselves, so to speak. As the Zohar goes on to say, to the king to whom peace belongs. That is the explanation that was explained elsewhere in the Zohar. Now, when is the song aroused? The song is aroused when the forces of evil are destroyed. And when the minions of the force of evil, who are the wicked people in the world, are removed from the world, are destroyed. It's kind of apropos what just happened in, uh, in Florida. When the evil people of this world are removed, um, then the song can be sung. And at that time, Moses will sing the song. It says, as Yashir, Moses will sing the song. He sang at the time of the splitting of the sea, but it's the, the expression used over there is singing in the future. He will sing in the future. And that's what the Zohar goes on to, uh, goes on to say. In order to be able to understand this, what this is all about, I would like to quote you a rabbinic teaching. The rabbinic teaching is this teaching over here. It's a Mishnah. Mishnah is the, basically the rudimentary form or the most, uh, not rudimentary is not the right word. It's the most cryptic and condensed, condensed form. That's the word I'm looking for. It's the most condensed form of the statement of Jewish law, right? There's many, many statements of Jewish law. There's six books covering all six aspects or six areas of, uh, of Jewish law all areas of life, in fact, including festivals, including um, financial issues, monetary damages, including uh, marriage contracts and divorces and all kinds of other things like that. Uh, every aspect of life is basically covered uh, in the Mishnah. And one of these Mishnah, uh, one of these Mishnah Yot, Mishnah in the plural, Mishnah Yot, Mishnahs, one of the Mishnahs uh, speaks about um, how you have to conduct yourself with your animals on the Sabbath. As you probably know, the ruling uh, in the Bible, the biblical ruling in, in the Torah, is that one's animals also have to rest on the Sabbath. You cannot let your animals work on the Sabbath. Animals have to rest just like you do on the Sabbath. However, there are... Um, uh, some details in that that are interesting. For example, let's say there's an animal that walks always with a chain on its neck. Like, for instance, let's say a dog walks around with a collar, right? Now, carrying that collar could, I suppose, in some sense, be considered work. So the question is, are you, let your, are you allowed to let your dog walk around in the public domain, in other words, outside of the house, with his collar on, or let your animal, your pack animal, let's say you have a horse or, a, or, a, or an ox, right, that has a chain around its neck, because it's usually harnessed to a plow, or it's harnessed to a wagon, or it's harnessed to uh, some kind of uh, whatever it is. So that ox always has a chain around its neck, or that donkey, or that, uh, or that horse, right, has a, or your dog with its collar. It always has is it allowed to walk outside in the public domain with its collar on? Or is that regarded as making the animal do work? So the Mishnah rules that called Bale Hasher, all of those animals that normally wear a chain, a chain is the word share, chain, Yoitzim Basher, they can go out with their chains. Venim Shachim Basher, you can even draw them, you can drag them along, not drag them along, but lead them along with their chains. In other words, if you have to lead the animal to water where it can drink or something like that, you can drag the chain and uh, lead the animal that way. You can draw him towards the water or whatever, towards food, right? If he has a chain around his neck. Okay, fine. That is the ruling and that has to do with the Sabbath. Now, when the author of the Tanya, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, he was one of the, he was the third generation of Hasidic rabbis, was the Baal Shem Tov. And then there was the Magid of Mizrich, 
the Baal Shem Tov had many disciples, but the, the, the chief uh, disciple and the one who took over his successor was called the Magid Mizrich. And then the Magid Mizrich had 60 main students. And Rabbi Shneir Zalman was one of them. He was the youngest of them and possibly the... Um, he certainly became the successor to the Magid Mizrich in Eastern Europe. The one who first became the successor to the Magid Mizrich was someone named Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, but he left for Israel. And Rabbi Shneir Zalman stayed behind and he became the de facto leader of um, Hasidus, Hasidic teachings in um, certainly in Russia and um, other parts of Eastern Europe primarily. In any event, he was giving a class, or he was giving a, what's called a shiur. He was giving a, he was giving a talk, a lecture, and he quoted this Mishnah. He quoted the statement that all animals who have a chain can go out with their chain, and they can be drawn along with their chain. But he changed the wording slightly. Instead of the word share, you see in Hebrew, when, uh, when you write Hebrew, you actually don't write Hebrew with the vowels. These points underneath, um, can I get a point over here? I don't know. These points underneath, they're like this line and these two dots and so on and so forth, and the dots on top, these are all vowel points in Hebrew. They're not actually written in biblical um, works. They're not written in there. They just just the letters, the consonants are written, but not the vowels. So therefore, sometimes, and this is one of the beauties of the Hebrew language, you can read the word with different vowels as well, and then it has a different meaning. So instead of reading it as besher, kol bala hasher, yotim besher, and imishachim besher all animals with a chain, a chain is a share. He read it as the word shear. You can see the difference over here. There's only one dot under here, whereas here there's two. Here the two dots under there is pronounced a, share, like an a, or called a tseire, right? This is called a chirik and it's pronounced e, called bale shear, right? Okay, so. Uh, that would be like an I sound, right? The, 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 uh, the I vowel. Okay, so he translated it like this, and he said, Of course, he explained the literal meaning of it, the way it's written in the Mishnah, but then he said, you can understand it like this too, that all the masters of song go out with song and they're drawn along with song. Who are the masters of song? Well, there's two explanations of that. One of the masters of song, one category of masters of song is actually the angels. The angels, as you probably heard traditionally, you'll have the you know, choir in heaven, so to speak, and they, they sing. But more importantly, the concept of song is those people who sing and they sing as part of their divine service like the Levites did in the temple but we also do now when song becomes part of their worship, part of their um, uh, modus operandi, let's call it, the way they operate, the way they do things, then they, are, they go out with song and they drawn along with song. We said before, the concept of song is to lift one up to a higher level. So this is exactly what he says. The masters of song can be drawn out with song. In other words, not necessarily through learning, not necessarily through meditation, not necessarily through, Kab uh, through Kabbalistic means, but simply through song of the right sort, the soul can go into a state, a person can go into a state of ecstasy. That's your theme. He goes out with song. And he's drawn along, he's drawn upwards with song. So um, when Rabbi Shneir Zaman of uh, Liadi said these, uh, said these words, uh, there was a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, of arousal, spiritual arousal, and people were very uh, moved by this whole idea because song is a very important part of Hasidic uh, ritual. Rituals are not really the right word, but I'm just going to use it because I can't think of another one right now. 
practice, let's put it that way. It's part of Hasidic practice. Singing is a very important part of Hasidic practice. And there are things called nigunim, songs, often without words, that are very soulful and very, uh, very elevating, very uplifting. Okay. So some of the, uh, uh, one in particular, one, one disciple of Rabbi Shnei Zaman Liadi was visiting there when he said this, when he um, uh, said this innovative idea. When he went back to the town that he lived in, uh, which was a, um, which was a stronghold of opponents of Hasidic thought, the people that were very opposed in the first generations of, of Hasidism, they were very opposed to the Hasidic ways of doing things, but they weren't used to it. And they didn't know it was after the time of Shabtai Tzvi, and they were very worried that this was starting another chapter. Shabtai Tzvi was a person who um, was, very, very, he was very charismatic, and he drew a lot of people towards him. Uh, but he was a charlatan, and unfortunately, he dragged a lot of people down into real, um, really bad things. I'm talking about all, you know, really, really bad things. Um, idol, idolatry, basically, and uh, all kinds of things that are just, um, whatever, let's not get into it. But, uh, so they were very worried, the, what, what they call them, misnagdim, the opponents of Hasidism are called mis- misnagdim or mitnagdim. They opposed, the word mitnagdim is to oppose, they opposed Hasidic uh, innovations. So he was in a stronghold of this, uh, this, this, this disciple of Rabbi Shnei Azam and lived in a town that was a stronghold of opponents, opponents to the Hasidic way. And um, he, um, so this fellow um, decided amongst a few friends of his to, uh, to repeat this idea because that's what you do. You repeat, you repeat things that you hear from uh, elevated uh, souls, from people who are your teachers and so on. You repeat these things to others. And that's how the word gets around. And he repeated this teaching that all those who are masters of song can be elevated, they can be drawn out by song and drawn upwards by through song. So he repeated this in public, and there was a huge outcry and, 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 uh, by, the, um, by the opponents. What kind of explanations, what kind of commentary are you giving on legal terminology? How dare you explain it like that, and so on and so forth. It's quite an uproar. But, um, you know, as things are normally uh, do, and uh, die down after a few months, and then they heard that Ramashnaya Zaman of Liadi was coming that way. He was coming through that town. He was on his way somewhere and uh, visiting his disciples, I guess, and uh, he was going to come through that town. So even though the opponents of Hasidism were, uh, were very, um, very, very anti Hasidic thought, but nevertheless, they understood and they knew that Rabbi Shnei Zalman was a great, great scholar. And uh, they, 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 um, they planned that he would give a talk. He would give a lecture. So uh, as soon as he came to town, they invited him to give his lecture and so on and so forth. And he, you know, he said um, that he would do it. Obviously, it wasn't supposed to be the same day. Give him a little bit of time to prepare. Uh, and he said to them, any questions that you may have, give them to me in writing beforehand, right? Give, me, give them to me in writing beforehand so I can look over them and think, some, think them through, and then I'll be able to answer all your questions. Which was the tradition. That's how things were usually done. You gave a lecture, and then you answered questions. Um, so everyone gathered in the synagogue, and there was one of these huge synagogues of hundreds of people over there, and... Um, he started off his speech and he said as follows. He said, um, there are many, many different and varied questions which were presented to me. And it's kind of difficult to find a topic that would cover all of the questions and answer them all at once, which would be the ideal way of doing things. So what I decided to do is I'm going to quote a Mishnah from the section, from the uh, Masechet, from the tractate called Sabbath, Shabbat, Shabbos. And he, he proceeded to, uh, to quote exactly this, this Mishnah that we mentioned before. And uh, he explained it exactly as, we expla- and, as, as uh, has he explained it to his, uh, um, his um, uh, disciples before that it caused a huge uproar uh, in that town. 
So as soon as he said, all those, the masters of song are drawn out by song and so on and so forth. <laughs> See, all the opponents of Hasidism, like they started to boil, uh, you know, get hot under the collar and to, and to boil and get very angry and so on and so forth. But that wouldn't have been a, a proper for them to, uh, to protest um, such a great scholar. In, uh, in a rude way. So um, they kept quiet for a minute and he continued and he said, so therefore, I'm not going to give a lecture, but I am going to sing a song, right? <laughs> and he started singing, he had a beautiful voice. And he was actually a composer of, uh, of many, many beautiful songs. Um, ten primarily, uh, which are known to be very spiritually elevating songs. But anyway, he started singing this particular song. Now, they couldn't leave uh, the synagogue. Uh, it would have been very rude. Uh, and the, his voice and the song actually captured them. It captured their souls. And one of the, one of the participants over there, one of the opponents who was initially an opponent, actually from this whole incident became a disciple of Rabbi Shnei Zalman. And he said that he spoke to his friends afterwards, and he said all of them, the question that they had and the question to which they presented their rabbi, who was going to answer it, everything was answered during the song, right? While he was singing, they sort of fell into a reverie, and they were lifted up to a higher plane of existence, and there all their questions were answered. That's where their questions were answered. And we have to understand that how this works. We said before that song lifts the soul up to a higher level. It's the song that um, everyone desires to hear, so to speak. It's the song of desire, the desired song. It's the song that lifts one up into a spiritual, a state of spiritual elevation. And therefore, what was previously a question is no longer a question, it's dissolved. I know the answer because I'm in a higher state of being. And that's what he did. And that's what the Zohar here is referring to. Not only does the word Bereshit mean in the beginning, in the beginning of creation, but it also means in the beginning before, on a, sorry, on a level that transcends questions, on a level that transcends doubt, on a level that transcends conflict. And that's what the whole concept of song here is all about. It's the song that we all desire. In other words, that level of contemplation and of reverie that lifts us, lifts us, uh, lifts us out of the world of, of conflict and out of the world of questioning and out of the world of, um, of, uh, of uncertainty and... and, and uh, opaqueness into a world of clarity. And that's what essentially he was doing by singing the song. He realized that there was no way he would have enough time to be able to answer all of the questions presented. But everyone there could have his question answered for him if he would be on a higher level of being. So that's what he did. He lifted everybody up. And that's in fact the whole concept of what he was explaining. When you take a song, masters of song, through singing can lift themselves and others up and they can be drawn upwards through song. And that's what this uh, section of the Zohar is all about. <laughs> okay, any questions, folks? Any questions? No. How about dance? Absolutely dance. Absolutely dance. Dance can do the same thing. In fact, there were um, there were, um, 
many of the uh, in, in, in amongst amongst Hasidim, there were many who um, would actually that was one of their forms of uh, of worship. That was one of the forms of of uh, of cleaving to God. That was through dance. Uh, Moshe Leib of Sasov comes to mind, and others. Dance very important uh, part of um, very important part of uh, of things. Yes. Um, yeah. Here we go. Um, I just found the Song of Songs. I remember what file it was in, so <laughs> I'm going to show it to you. If anyone else uh, wants to ask a question, you can go ahead. Here we go. Here. This is the Song of Songs by yours truly. This is translated by yours. The Song of Songs for he to whom peace belongs. He will kiss me from his mouth to mine for your love is better than wine. And it goes on and there's explanations. And in the meanwhile, there's explanations in, in, in the Zohar of um, all that this is all about. Right? Song of Supernal Angels, the Song of the Soul, and so on and so forth, as you can see. And everything is explained like I did in the first volume of my Zohar, but I never, um, I never finished this Shira Shiram, unfortunately. <laughs> Pure, uh, unadulterated stupidity, I guess. <laughs> um, can I send it to you? Well, I don't want anyone else to publish it in my, you know, in their name or whatever. <laughs> I should finish it. I got a crowdfunded. That's what I got to do. I got a crowdfunded, somehow or another. Um, maybe we'll see. I will send it to you when it's done. Uh, so, the songs are very powerful. Uh, Wendy says songs are very powerful. You're right. The words can slip by conscious filters. Can you talk about songs with words and songs without words? Yes. Songs with words are to a certain extent limited to the words. In other words, the words define the song, whereas songs without words the the natural um, rise and fall to, uh, I can't think of a better word of the tune actually doesn't it it transcends the thinking mind it transcends the mind w words in a song have to be thought about and they have to be understood whereas um, the tune is of a higher level in fact Let's put it this way. In Kabbalistic um, explanation, there are, in fact, four levels. There are four things. There, is, there are letters. There are the vowels that we mentioned before, the vowels of the letters, the vowels associated with the letters. Then in the Torah, there, you know, there are what are called the crowns, on the uh, the crowns on the letters, the crowns on the letters, and then uh, let me see here. Um, just one second. I'll show you an example. I'll show you an example. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Let me just make this a little bigger. Um, here we go. It's not it's not ideal, but here you can see you see these stones on some of the letters, not all of the letters. The letters Shatnes Guts are the ones that have crowns on top of them, thorns or crowns on top of them. Certain letters have crowns on top of them, as you can see. So those are called the tagin. So there's the letters, there's the dots, uh, which form the vowels. Then there's the crowns on the letters, and these crowns have uh, meaning. They have meaning. Um, without going into it now, I don't want to go into it now, but um, the big, very big thing in Kabbalah about this and then there's what's called the Ta'amim. The Ta'amim. Uh, let's see here. Maybe I could find uh, um, Ta'amim. 
Tame Hakriya. Uh, here we go. Let's see Tame Hakriya. Tame Mikra. Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah, you see. Um, yeah, you see. Oh, disappeared. Um, it's kind of messy over here, but if you could you could probably see here are letters. Uh, sorry, here are the uh, vowels, the dots underneath and on top, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in red. And here's the some of the ta'amim, the sounds. This tells you how to sing these letters. They sung when when one reads out of the Torah. Okay, so um, let's see. Here we are. Okay. Yes, a few more of them. Um, you see these things on top of the letters, Shalshelet, etc. These things here. These sort of looks like a lightning thing. Anyway, whatever. Those are those are called the tamim. That is that represents the highest level of of those four levels, where again we spoke about the letters, the vowels, the crowns on top of the letters, and the um, tamim, the notes, the notes that the le that the letters are pronounced with, or uh, the the tune of the letters, is the highest level. That represents actually they all represent different holy names. This one represents the, the name which is called Ab, Ab, 72 letter name, right? It's a 72 letter name of God, and that is what is represented by the um, by the Ta'amim, by these uh, cantillation notes. That's what they call them, yeah, cantillation notes. And it, they correspond essentially to Chokhmah, to the Sfira of Chokhmah. Uh, as we said before, there are various Sfirot. Uh, what happened to that? Um, I think I closed it, it looks like. Oh no, here we go. Here we go. Okay. So the Tamim correspond to Chokhmah. And there are those that say that the Tamim correspond to Keter. Right? So the Tamim are very, very high level. Song is of a very high level. Now, dance is mostly in Malhut. But it also uh, has a tremendous um, impact. It's Netzachod Yosod and Malchut, mostly what are involved in dance. Okay, uh, let's get back to some of the questions over here in the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, the zigzag shape is very cool. What does it indicate? It indicates a certain way of saying, ah. ah, ah um, it's um, how, how the voice goes. It indicates that sort of zigzagging voice, I suppose. <laughs> um, when you hear the song of Anna Bakarach of Mesmerized by it, there's, no, there's a number of different ones, but yes. It is, song can be very mesmerizing, that's true. Uh, oh, I see he has a question about that as well. So songs transform, transform consciousness, yes, because songs are the highest form of consciousness, essentially. As I mentioned, it could be in Keter or in Chese or in Chochmah. Uh, what about the Anabah Koach? What can you tell us that this does for one? Uh, Anabah Koach is itself a, um, it's actually a, one of the holy names. It's just a, a spelling out of one of the holy names called Shem Mab Membet, 42 letter name. And... Um, it is the name which is associated also with elevation. So it's elevation within elevation. In other words, if that is sung, that has the ability to, to, to elevate one to a very lofty level if one concentrates properly. Okay. Any other questions, folks? Or uh, should we stop here? One new question. Oh, uh, no, thanks. Okay, good. All right, we're going to stop here. And uh, if anyone has questions, they can shoot me a question through email. Uh, as you know by now, kabbaladikaru at gmail.com or to my personal email. You're welcome. Uh, so next week 
Yeah, next week we will have a class. The following week we will not because it's Purim. But next week we'll still have a class. Uh, God willing. Okay. So have a great week, everybody. It is the month of Adar. The month of Adar is uh, the month when uh, the whole story of uh, Queen Esther, the downfall of Haman, Haman, and the whole story of Esther and Mordechai uh, took place in this month. And the sages say when the month of Adar comes in, we have to increase in joy. It's a time for increasing in joy. So every day this week, and this month, in fact, every day this month, keep in mind to be more joyful and do things that make you joyful. Listen to the right kind of music. It makes you joyful. And sing along and uh, raise yourself up. Do good things. And uh, hope to hear good news from everybody. So see you next week. All the best.